Ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, good morning. A warm welcome to all of you. My name is Elisabeth Türk. I'm the director of UNEC's Economic Cooperation and Trade Division. And it's my great pleasure to moderate this side event of UNECE's Regional Forum uh, on Sustainable Development. And we will be looking at the topic, Building Back Better After COVID-19, the role of innovation and trade. We are honored to organize this event in collaboration with the Geneva Trade Platform. And this webinar today is not only a side event of the UNECE Regional Forum, but it also follows several informal events we have organized jointly with the Geneva Trade I'm unmuted again, thank you. So it's great pleasure to do this event jointly with the Geneva Trade Platform. And uh, as I said before, the event is not only part of UNECE's regional forum, but it also follows several events we have organized with GTP in the past month. Jointly with GTP, we have covered issues such as e-commerce, circular economy, trade and investment trends, and WTO accession. Through these events, we aim at engaging with various stakeholders, particularly with stakeholders in UNECE's 17 program countries. These are countries with economies in transition, in Central Asia, Southern Caucasus, Western Balkan, and Eastern Europe. In case you missed one of our earlier events, you can view them on the Geneva Trade Platform's YouTube webpage, and that's also accessible through the UNECE website. And I'm very proud to say that you can view the recordings both in English and in Russian. Before diving into today's subject matter, and we will be discussing how to harness innovation, trade, and also trade facilitation for a resilient and inclusive and sustainable COVID recovery. Before we dive into the substance, let me recap a few housekeeping remarks. First of all, the event is being recorded. And as mentioned before, we'll make the recording available. Secondly, I'm very pleased that we are able to provide English-Russian interpretation. In order to access it, there are three steps. You need to download the Interaction app um, or access it from the web platform. You enter the event code and the, the event code is TRADE2021. And then you select the channel you wish. And all of these instructions are also in the chat, so you can go there and, and have a look. Thirdly, and that's for our audience, I would very much like to encourage our audience to engage with us. And you can do so in two ways. First of all, by asking questions and making comments through the chat. We will be monitoring the chat closely. And secondly, by voting on a few questions we've prepared. For the voting, we will be using an interactive software called Mentimeter. And um, in order to answer our questions on Mentimeter, you go to menti.com. So you can see that on the screen now. And you can use different electronic devices. You can use your iPhone, your tablet, your computer. And once you're at menti.com, you insert the code that's displayed on, on the screen right now. And um, then you type your response to our question. We have prepared one warm-up question, an icebreaker question for you. And that's why you are, we are asking you, how many webinars and online conferences have you attended in the past 12 months? So that's our icebreaker to see whether Mentimeter is working and we all uh, can engage that way. So please go ahead, answer the question, and uh, please feel free to um, know that uh, we will not attribute any answers, so all of this is anonymous. With this, we have covered the housekeeping. Now, let us go to the substance. And once again, ladies and gentlemen, I'm very pleased that we can have this discussion about how to harness trade and innovation for a post-COVID recovery today. COVID-19, more or less exactly a year ago in, in Geneva, um, um, it, the pandemic has really led to a global crisis and, and a global crisis that requires global solutions. What we have seen in the past are protectionist tendencies, we have seen supply chain disruptions, we have seen reshoring, and all of that has exacerbated the economic impact of the pandemic. 
And as we are now reflecting on, on ways to mitigate these devastating impacts of the pandemic, the role of innovation and the role of trade, they should really be cornerstones of our discussions. At the same time, the pandemic itself, it has been a catalyst for change. It has pushed for technological adaption. It has actually pushed us a little bit ahead of schedule in that regard. And businesses and institutions around the world, they had to innovate, they had to reinvent themselves in order to mitigate these negative impacts of the crisis. That has also led to a situation where the platform economy is growing, it's growing at double digit rates as a result of the pandemic. On the other hand, international trade, we have estimations that it has declined, declined significantly by about 8% due to the COVID restrictions, border restrictions, amongst others. And our studies have shown that micro, small, and medium-sized enterprises, particularly those that are export-oriented, they are amongst the worst hit financially by the COVID-19 pandemic. And that's really fundamental also for the UNECE region, where MSMEs, they represent over 90% of all companies in most countries, and they are also responsible for over half of GDP. Now, with these topics, innovation and trade and SMEs, I believe that today's webinar will provide a great platform to discuss the ways in which innovation and trade can help us unlock post-COVID sustainable, inclusive and resilient recovery in the UNECE region. What we will do is we will take the discussion across three mini sessions. The first session will look at the role of innovation in driving recovery and progress towards the SDGs. And here we will have two speakers. I'm very happy to introduce Mr. Anders Jönsson, Chief of the Innovative Policies Development Section at UNECE, and Mr. Joachim Wernbeck, who is the Research Director at the Swedish Entrepreneurship Forum. So that will be our first session. And the first session will be followed by brief remarks from our UNECE Executive Secretary, Ms. Olga Algayerova. After the remarks of our Executive Secretary, we will go to the second session. And in the second sessions, we will discuss the ways, how can we support export-oriented SMEs in bouncing back from the pandemic? In this session, I'm particularly delighted to welcome two ladies to our discussions here. We will have Ms. Damegul Kabeyeva, Minister Councillor of the Economic Section of the Mission of Kazakhstan, and she is also the Chair of UNECE's Steering Committee on Trade Capacity and Standards. And I'm delighted to welcome Ms. Tatiana Steryova Dushkovska, who is the Coordinator of the Chamber Investment Forum of the Western Balkan Six. And uh, we will be discussing in that session SMEs and non-tariff areas from both the government and the private sector perspective. Lastly, in session number three, we will discuss how to make trade more resilient through electronic business standards. And here we will benefit from the expertise of Mr. Alexei Vandarenka. He's the vice chair of UNCFAC, that's one of the very important intergovernmental processes in UNECE. And we will also have with us Mr. Mario Apostolov, who is the regional advisor at UNECE's Economic Cooperation and Trade Division. After each set of the interventions, we'll have time for questions, and I look forward to reading them in the Q&A box in, in the chat function. Now, before we start our first part, let us look at the Mentimeter, whether colleagues from the audience managed to engage, whether we have some answers there. And the, the initial question to warm us up for the debate was how many webinars have or online conferences have we all attended in the past month? And so we see that um, basically uh, ma many of our uh, participants in the audience have at least attended 20. 
Most of us have attended somewhere between 20 and 50 and some actually even more than 50 webinars. And I think that really shows us how we all had to adjust the ways how we work, how we engage. And one year into the COVID pandemic, we are now all familiar with these webinars. And, and I guess we have learned how to use them, but we also very much look forward to meeting in person again and having exchanges like this in, in, uh, in real world. Now, um, having uh, done all this housemark housekeeping and introduction, without any further ado, let me give the floor to the speakers of the first session to give us their perspectives on the role of innovation in driving recovery and progress towards the SDGs. More specifically, we'd like to know their perspectives on ways how innovation can create opportunities uh, through the so-called platform economy, and how we can ensure that the benefits and, and opportunities of the platform economy are also shared widely, both within societies in a country and also across countries. With this, I'm, I'm happy to introduce my colleague Anders Jonsson. Anders, you have the floor. Thank you very much, um, Elizabeth, um, dear participants and, and speakers. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, actually, I, uh, I will not speak about innovation as much as I will speak about the platform economy, um, but innovation is important in the sense that we're, we're, we're seeing it as we speak. Uh, we've had the, the possibility to do very good video conferences. In fact, I did my first one in, back in 2000. And yet, until the pandemic hit, uh, we still use phone calls broadly and almost never use these video conferences. We did them a few times. We did a few times. And the technology has been there. Uh, and it's almost a question why we didn't use it. And my point is basically that innovation is not as much about technology itself. There's a lot of technology out there, but how we actually put this technology into practice. And we can only hope that the, the, this pandemic having driven us to online platforms, that this will create habits and, and sources of value, uh, both for society and for the economy, that that will last and that will make us more, more productive in the future. Um, my remarks are based on the webinar on uh, building back better using platforms to enable sharing and progress towards uh, the circular economy. Um, as you all know, technology, uh, technology overall and platforms in particular are changing the way our economies and societies work. And most likely we only scratch the surface of the potential. And one of the things I want to kind of drive home in my, in my, in my remarks is how big this potential is. We don't know exactly what the economy and society of the future are going to look like, but we do know that we're in the middle of a process of secular transformation uh, that, that, has basically on, that has basically only started and we don't know what's going to come up. Uh, now platforms uh, like the one we are on now or things like Amazon or Google and a host of others. In fact, I would expect that most of you are members of at least 10 different digital platforms as we, as we speak, is in fact an ancient idea. It's applying the logic of, let's say, the Sukk of Ur in the ancient Sumeria to um, different contexts. Um, the, difference, the difference is that we now have the technological possibility to do this about with almost anyone, with almost, with almost any specific group of people and whenever, whenever we want to, and we didn't have this before. So if you go back to Adam Smith, he said that countries grow by specializing. You become more productive by specializing, but the specialization is limited by the extent of the market. Now, arguably, we're at the threshold of a world where the limits, to, where the limits to the extent of the market have fallen, and and and, and it will become it will become uh, reorganized. And that's an exciting opportunity, and we're only seeing the beginning the beginning of this here. Now, platforms basically create vast opportunities to exchange, uh, share, and interact by radically reducing what economists call transaction costs. Basically, the things that stood in the way uh, from doing things before. Um, and there are basically three things that platforms do. They triangulate, which means that they bring supply and demand together. Uh, they ensure trust. If you go to Airbnb, for instance, the trust is not because you know the person, but because you know there's a system behind it with reviews. And platforms manage to create this 
and make sure the transactions happen that wouldn't happen otherwise. People wouldn't hitchhike, but they would use block card. So we see, the, we see this all over. And they provide the transfer or the transactions, the financial transactions of the tax of goods and services. Um, now, adopting to, to COVID, of course, has given, especially in the B2C, this is the consumer area, this big push. And we've seen double digit growth in most uh, B2C segments um, over the past uh, over the past year. Uh, the rapid emergence, for instance, of high-end food delivery, almost completely new sector in, in, uh, in, in, in large cities and exponential growth, especially in the Russian Federation. But the remaining potential is enormous in particular, um, in particular, if you look at this from a sustainable development perspective, we have, for instance, uh, SDG 12, sustainable production and consumption. Of course, we also want to pull people out of poverty and into the middle class. So we basically need to consume more while actually producing less or at least using less resources or using resources sustainably. And that seems like a contradiction, but platforms can help us resolve this by basically putting excess capacity to use. And if you think about it, 90% of the things you own, or for that matter, many of the skills that you have are not used at a, at a single time. Think about your cars, your houses. One example that our expert gave is power tool. Why? The average power tool or the medium power tool um, in the US is used only for 20 minutes. It's cost over $200. People buy them to drill one or two holes. Now imagine instead you go to Uber, you say you want a power tool, an automated vehicle pulls up, delivers it to your pod, you use it for one hour, it's a high-end power tool, and you pay a few dollars for it. That would make everything more convenient. Plus, these expensive power tools would be more would be affordable to almost all people. So we're also talking about the large potential of, of democratization of excess, excess capacity. So this means that on the consumer side, the potential is enormous. Many of the worries that, that people have are actually on the producer side, especially for countries with economies in transition. How do you actually produce value instead of it, apart from the consumer surplus that people get? And this is one of the concerns uh, that, people, that people have. Um, it also raises the question of whether, whether measure, measuring production um, as GDP is, uh, the best, is the best way of looking at things because of the enormous consumer surplus that you have. They ask, for instance, people what they would, in the US, what they would pay uh, not to have internet in Google for one month. And many people responded over $1,000. That's your consumer surplus, the difference between what you pay and how much you actually value something. And it's enormous, that's about 95 to 99% of the value is. And we're not capturing this in the GDP figures. Um, I'll just go through two or three policy implications. Um, and then it's a very complex topic. And we don't, but I would like to leave some time for questions too. Some of the policy implications that we discussed in the session was managing trade-offs between um, network externalities to need to have a certain critical amount of supply and demand at the same time, and ensuring neutrality and competitive markets. Uh, Metcalf, the Metcalf, uh, philosopher Metcalf law concentration basically says that any network externalities lead to market dominance. How do we deal with that? And we see the world dealing with this issue as we speak. It's about another issue is managing the trade-offs between the need to enable broad use um, and trade of data with data security and, and privacy. This is a thorny issue and we don't have any clear solutions yet. Dealing with legacy regulation um, that often prevent innovation. Um, we see many discussions about this as well. And the need for agile governance and a flexible uh, approach to, to, to regulation, where you focus on what your impact uh, should be rather than the specific technical specifications, which in most cases will fall foul or prevent uh, innovation that diverges from um, the, technology, the, technology at the, the technology at the moment. These are some of the issues that came up. There are many more, um, but we don't have much time and I would like to leave some room for questions. And I think uh, Joachim from, from Sweden will, um, will have some examples from the Swedish experience. Thank you. Many thanks, Anders, for this, for um, highlighting this, the three T's. Now, what can platforms bring? Triangulation, trust, and, and transactions. And also for raising already important issues such as SDG 12, sustainable consumption and produ production, and circular economy. And let me flag here that 
uh, UNECE's 69th commission session scheduled for mid-April uh, will be devoted to the topic of circular economy and the sustainable use of natural resources and platform economy definitely uh, would be an important aspect here as well. And as you've pointed to the policy uh, challenges as well, dealing with network externalities, um, legacy regulation and, and ensuring agile governance. So, so these are definitely some policy uh, challenges to address. Before we move to Mr. Wernberg, is there anything you wish to add in terms of now, what do policymakers have to address to, to help us get towards using the platform economy for building back better? Is this addressed to you, Akim? I think it wasn't clear, Elizabeth. Okay. Thank you. Um, so, Anders, let, uh, let us then go to Mr. Wernberg, to, to your Kim. And um, before that, let us also have a look at uh, our first Mentimeter question. Yeah? I understand that we are engaging the audience. Yeah? And um, what we would like to know from our audience is what are the most important tasks for growing the platform economy in your country? and for doing so in an inclusive and sustainable way. So our audience can engage on that. If you go to, to Mentimeter, um, you can pick your answers and we'll come back to the answers uh, after our intervention by Mr. Wernberg. Yeah? Let me then now move to, to Mr. Wernberg and, and we keep Anders with us for follow-up discussion subsequently. Now, um, Mr. Wernberg, uh, you are joining us from uh, the Swedish Entrepreneurship Forum. You are there, the research director for Megatrends. Uh, definitely some job titles in, in the private sector are, are cooler than others, but you definitely have an interesting position here. Um, now, Sweden is one of the few countries in the UNECE region that seems to be taking really a strategic approach to developing the, the platform economy. And Joachim, can you tell us a little bit more about why Sweden has made the platform economy a strategic priority and what are you doing to promote it? The, the floor is yours, Joachim. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. Uh, so uh, first, just for anyone who hasn't heard about the Swedish Entrepreneurship Forum, we're a research institute uh, that are positioned between academic research and policy making. So we conduct and aggregate policy relevant research. Uh, and in my case, specifically on new technologies and mega trends to make it available to policymakers and to, to fuel the discussion with evidence, basically. So I also want to highlight that we're actually launching a discussion paper series next week, dealing with platform economies and, uh, well, the subjects we're bringing up here, building back, back better. So how do we get competitiveness and competition in a good way with platforms within Europe? Uh, so that might be interesting to some of you. Uh, I want to raise three issues. Some of them are overlapping with Mr. Johnson. But the first one is that we are basically, even before the pandemic, we're shifting our economy and our economic activities from uh, being limited by scarcity, that is trying to find someone to trade with, to selectivity, where we have to pick someone to trade with because we have an abundance of potential interactions we could engage with. And this is the upside of digitalization and the internet. But without platform economies, and, and when I say platform economies, I mean platforms that bring together at least two different groups and match them together. Without these economies, we cannot leverage the benefits of digital technology. It's as simple as that. So platforms are something that they didn't come with digitalization, but they are crucial to our ability to use digitalization for building better economies. And what they're doing essentially, just as Mr. Johnson said, is they're allowing us to allocate resources more efficiently. So by letting people rent out their summer houses or their cars or their power tools, by making it easier for businesses to find each other, by making it possible for a SME to create a business model that wouldn't be viable in their home market, but it is if they can trade on an international market, even if they're just one or two people selling a product that's very niche. They can do this with platform economies. They wouldn't be able to otherwise. But of course, this leads to a lot of policy issues. 
And the most current now is competition, of course. And I want to bring up two points that I think are important when we try to figure out how to best make use of platform economies. The first one is hetero heterogeneity. That is, we have a huge variation of platforms. There is no platform industry where we can say that all the companies within this industry are similar enough to be regulated in the same way, for instance. Platforms will, according to the sector they're trying to uh, build their business model in, they're going to look very different. And perhaps even more importantly, the way they're used going to, is going to be very different. So if we take a specific platform, let's say we have a gig economy platform, that could actually be used by, on the one hand, low-skilled manual workers. This is what we see mostly within larger cities where, where the tasks are, uh, that are being redistributed are um, time sensitive or location sensitive. But the same platform could be used by high skilled knowledge intensive uh, business consultants who are building their own firms, their one man firms, um, and using this as an additional source of income or even becoming uh, entrepreneurs, uh, even if they're not growing that business, they're just consultants basically. And they would be depending on how we try to accommodate that platform, we're going to affect both of these groups simultaneously. And that's going to be a large policy issue, policy issue in the future. The second point that I think is important to, to uh, think about in, from a policy point of view is, and this is, is uh, highly established in, in international research. It is not the new technology per se, but the way we enable institutional change or something the economists call complementary innovations. That's what's going to determine how much productivity we get from new technologies. And when we try to adapt to new uh, types of technologies, such as platforms, we can do this in different ways. I want to bring up two examples that are current in the Swedish debate. The first is healthcare, where we see, and this is also the case from, from a long line of research, that the new ways of using technology are most often brought up by startups, small companies, because they have no institutional legacy. They can organize around the new technology from scratch. But they're also outside of the established institutional framework where all the incumbent firms are. So when it comes to healthcare, we have in Sweden and around Europe and the world, uh, a burgeoning amount of platforms that are supplying uh, digital healthcare services. But in most countries, just as in Sweden, they are outside of the established healthcare system. So there's something that we're increasingly debating now that's called information continuity. So from a patient point of view, you would want your information to be continuous between a digital service provider and your ordinary healthcare provider so that your, your patient file could be easily transferred between these two. And that's something that hasn't been done and this is becoming an increasingly important bottleneck and we've seen this throughout the pandemic as well. So this is a big issue in Sweden right now and in many other places. The second one is the gig economy, where in Sweden unions and different platform providers or platform companies uh, are uh, trying to agree on a, different, on a uh, collective agreement for giggers. And this might seem like a good solution. It's too early to tell if it's going to increase the efficiency of the economy or not, but there are some caveats to it. Uh, the first one is that we're essentially not changing the institutional framework. We're trying to figure out how to fit the platform companies into that framework. And by doing so, we're saying that we're welcoming technological innovation, but we're not producing significant job innovation. Instead, we are trying to accommodate new technologies, but keeping the old way of organizing work and jobs. Uh, so we might miss out on job innovation here. And job innovation is going to be extremely important for building back better after the pandemic, as well as in the larger debate of the future of work. The second part is that if uh, platforms start to, for example, hire uh, their bike riders or their taxi drivers, they conform to a traditional business model, meaning that they essentially cease being platforms, at least to a significant degree. And that would, in a long-term perspective, mean that we might lose out on new ways of, well, inventing jobs. So those are my three points. Thank you for having me.
Many thanks, uh, Jörg, and many thanks, Mr. Wernberg, for clearly flagging uh, three points and also for raising the importance of uh, job innovation. And I think that very nicely links to a discussion we had yesterday as part of the regional forum, where we looked at the future of work and questions of digitalization and platform economy also came up strongly here. Now, I can see we have uh, a very rich uh, discussion and questions already in the chat as well. L let me pick two or three and post to our two speakers. And then we look at Mentimeter and I see then that our executive secretary is with us. So we will then uh, also move to Ms. Olga Gajerova. Welcome Olga to, to our forum here. Now, um, question from the chat. Uh, one question, and I guess it's directed to, to you, Kim, was to tell us a little bit more about what the Swedish government is doing to support the platform economy. Yeah, and you, you flagged already some of the issues. Then there is also a um, uh, more general question about what's the role of innovation policy in, in supporting the platform economy. And I think that directly also links to UNECE work we are doing as part of our innovative policy uh, section. So maybe that's a, a question for Anders. And uh, myself, I would love to ask you both to flag a little bit what is the dimension or the perspective of transition economies and is there anything specific we need to bear in mind in this regard. So I mute myself and maybe give the floor first to Joachim and, and then to Anders. Okay, so uh, the very quick response would be that there are no specific programs aimed at growing the platform economy as a whole. And that's because, as I said, there is no platform industry. So instead, what we're seeing is uh, scattered debates where policymakers, uh, if, if we talk about platforms, most policymakers, most people overall will think about uh, companies like Spotify or perhaps Klarna that deal with, with financial transactions. Um, but just as I had a seminar with, um, uh, with the industrial branch of government a few weeks back, uh, and we had a uh, digital healthcare provider uh, to come along and, and talk about their platform, that was uh, a moment of realization to many people in the room that these are also platforms because we tend to think of them in silos. So digital healthcare is one thing, Spotify and entertainment and music, Netflix, that's something completely different. Uh, again, something that the government is, well, not doing, but supporting is uh, uh, the emergence, the inclusion or integration of gig economies, gig platforms uh, into the Swedish uh, labor system. But again, Sweden is divided so that unions and employers organize the labor market within, within an institutional framework on their own. And that's what's happening right now. So government is not driving that change. Um, but what government could do in Sweden and in developing countries in terms of, of um, empowering innovation would be to enable experiment because these platforms cannot be built in isolation. Most of them, especially if we look like something like uh, healthcare, you cannot build a fully scalable digital startup around healthcare services without engaging with a healthcare system. You need ways to be allowed to integrate a new technology. There is a historian of technology, Nathan Rosenberg, who said that we have to, when technology becomes sufficiently complex, we have to learn by using. We have to uh, integrate a new technology into the existing systems in order to be able to scale it, to innovate it, and to make use of it. So we can't do it in isolation. We can't prototype these things. We need to find new ways to experiment, basically. A uh, typical example would be to allow uh, driverless vehicles, which Stockholm, I believe, the council in Stockholm has done for a driverless bus. Uh, and that was one company and one bus for one period of time. We need to do much, much more to test this technology in practice. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Wernbeck. So the absence of a coherent view of the platform economy or industry as such has, has policy implications in terms of lack of policy. And there is indeed scope to do more, most importantly, to enable innovation. And that's something that would apply both to developed economy as well as to economies in transition. Now, uh, Anders, we are already in the area of innovation policy. What's your take on that? Thank you, Elizabeth. By, by the way, I've, I've seen this bus um, outside of Stockholm. It's, it's adorable. It moves very, very slowly, um, but it, it shows that it can be done. Um, and there's enormous 
potential testing autonomous vehicles alone. I mean, think about not having to own cars anymore, but still having access to uh, transportation that's at least as convenient as, as, it, is, as, it, is, uh, as it is today. It's an amazing prospect. Um, I think there were two questions. One was on, uh, on, on the implication for, uh, implications for transition economies. Um, of course, on the consumption side, um, there are lots of good news. In fact, many of the transition economies have proven better at experimenting with, with, some, with some technologies, such as, uh, for instance, Nur Sultan and, and, and autonomous vehicles than uh, established economies have. And um, prices are low, um, and and, uh, uh, or sometimes uh, there are no prices at all. So more and more services uh, will be available to, to even um, the least fortunate uh, segments of society. So that's, that's good news. Platform economies is also good news because it means that more and more, um, more, and more products uh, that used to be high-end um, uh, will be available to more, to more and more people. On the production side, uh, however, there are some people who are pointing to, uh, for instance, the large, um, uh, the growing skills gap, and I would say also the grit uh, gap. Uh, you really have to navigate through all kinds of opportunities. You need to know what you're going to do to make the most, to make the most out of this. And we cannot expect uh, everyone to have those skills and, and those and, 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 and that grit. And uh, what we call the skills premium, the skills premium will grow even more and more. So it's not, it's not clear at all what, what will happen. I think in many of the transition countries we have here, we do see opportunities. Um, we do see a relatively high level of digital infrastructure development. Uh, we, we do see relatively high skills in the workforce. Couple that with moderate wage level and experiment experimentation with the platform economy. And there are lots of opportunity in what we can broadly call business process outsourcing. So doing things that can be done over distance and where your wages are competitive with others. So we see quite a bit of movement on that side. Um, on the other question of what the role of innovation policy is, one of the things that we're advocating is to take a broad view of, of innovation, to see innovation policy almost as much a, a coordinating instance across different policy areas um, as, as, uh, uh, as, as having its own policies per se, or at least that's, that aspect is at least as important. There are a few obvious things that we need to work on. One is uh, skills, building the right skills um, to have a constant feedback mechanism uh, with the labor market and with entrepreneurship opportunities. Um, of course, build the digital infrastructure, um, soft and hard infrastructure, in other words, uh, to look at different, uh, different ways of going about uh, regulation and coordinating approaches to regulation across countries, because almost all of these phenomena have some kind of uh, cross-national uh, dimension. In addition to that, though, we, we do like to advocate that there is a role for direct uh, support of specific sectors and specific initiatives. The rationale for this is that the person that tries something innovative um, is going to face um, is going to face enormous privatized risk. So if he or she fails, he or she will bear all the risk. If he or she is successful, society will have most of the return. So it's hard to, pri to privatize the returns. And the returns are also, if you look at Edam in Belarus, for instance, was one of the first investors in business process and software outsourcing sector. That investor arguably um, set uh, demonstrated that it's possible uh, that this that this uh, sector is viable in Belarus and led to the flourishing of the sector subsequently. So enormous returns compared to the private returns that he would have. That he would have. So one of the roles of innovation policy is to make sure that more of this experimentation is taking place than otherwise would be the case. And there are some modest uh, mechanisms that where, where public support can have a capability grow. And we will discuss this actually on Monday. We have a training in the handbook coming out on innovative. Uh, high growth enterprises, and we would, uh, if anyone is interested in that, then please contact us, and and we'll invite you on Tuesday. Saves the three webinars. I'll stop there because we have our executive secretary. But thank you very much for the questions and for the opportunity to speak. Thank you very much, Anders, and you've brought us right to the core of innovation policy. That's also where we had our audience uh, ask our audience to engage. Shall we quickly look at what our audience had to say in terms of um, different um, 
what are the most important tasks for growing the platform economy in your country in, in a sustainable and inclusive way. And here we gave to our audience different type of policy options. And what we can see from, from the responses here is clearly that ICT infrastructure is seen as one of, is seen as the most important task, followed by regulatory frameworks. And I could imagine that questions such as competition issues also come in when, it, uh, when we discuss regulatory frameworks. So thank you very much to our audience for engaging here. Let me now close this first segment, clearly scope for much more discussion on the role of innovation and, and uh, platform economies. And let us turn to uh, Ms. Olga Algayerova, who has joined us. Olga Algayerova, the Executive Secretary of UNECE. Olga, many thanks for the support you are providing to our work in the Economic Cooperation and Trade Division and for joining us here. Um, very pleased to have you and the floor is yours. Thank you, dear Elizabeth, distinguished delegates, panelists, dear colleagues. And it was great introduction to the event by you, by Anders, by Joachim, by giving us these learning examples from Sweden. And it's really my pleasure to join you at this side event of the Regional Forum on Sustainable Development for the UNEC region on recovering better after COVID-19 and the role of innovation and trade. I understand you already discussed the role of innovation in the first segment of this side event, and you will now be transitioning to discussing the role of trade. Allow me at this point to make my remarks on the topic, a topic which I consider of great importance and to welcome you all to this side event. It is now more than a year since the COVID-19 pandemic started sweeping the globe. There is a hope today that with vaccination campaigns ramping up, we will be able to overcome the health crisis this year. But the restrictions that the pandemic has imposed on economic activity and indeed on everyday life have already caused great damage behind a significant decline in GDP lie in some sectors and countries, massive job losses, bankruptcies, bankruptcies and disruption to trade. Even more so than in the aftermath of the global financial crisis a decade ago, the ones suffering the most are often the already vulnerable, less developed countries, job intensive domestic service industries, low skilled workers for whom working from home is really not an option. The elderly and those stuck on the wrong side of the much vaunted digital divide. And this has been a setback, especially for the prosperity and inclusiveness pillars of uh, Agenda 2030. And so now is the time to ask how we can not only recover from the pandemic, but recover better or build forward, creating more resilient, more productive, but also more sustainable and inclusive societies in our UNEC region. This is the topic of the Regional Forum on Sustainable Development, and it will be also the topic of the high-level political forum at the global level later this year in July. UNEC has a large number of instruments and initiatives that can support its member states in their efforts to tackle the crisis and promote a sustainable recovery. In spring 2020, we have created an action framework around three pillars. First is facilitate connectivity, second address transboundary and other risk, and then support a green and resilient recovery. This side event here today with its focus on the role of innovation and trade in recovery from COVID-19 is a great opportunity to showcase some of our work in these two areas, innovation and trade, that are absolutely critical for recovering better. It's also a great opportunity to learn more about how innovation and trade have been affected by the pandemic and how countries are using innovation and trade to facilitate connectivity and support a green and resilient recovery. You have already discussed the role of innovation and indeed 
the very fact that we are holding this event on Zoom with interpretation by Interactio is already an example of innovation in the platform economy and how it can help overcome some of the COVID-19 related restrictions. Just a year ago, very few people have ever heard of Zoom or Interactio, especially here at the, at the United Nations Secretariat. And today they are our household names. This rapid uptake is just one example of how adversity is the mother of innovation. The technology has been around for a long time, turning invention into innovation, however, involves changing our habits to put them to best use. Innovation is driving dynamic growth in the platform economy. And this has certainly created new jobs and also preserved existing jobs during the pandemic. But as you have already discussed, more can and more needs to be done to fully realize the platform's economy's potential for sustainable development. Perhaps more importantly, it allows us to make use of excess capacity out there, allowing us to combine the consumption needed to pull people into the middle class while producing less, using resources responsibly and taking care of our environment. The same can be said of trade. The pandemic has disrupted many international supply chains and trade patterns overall. Trade has also been a conduit through which demand losses due to the pandemic have spread from country to country. Micro, small and medium-sized enterprises have been affected particularly severely. And so expanding trade again and doing so in a safe, resilient and inclusive way will be very important for the post-COVID recovery. And here using platforms, electronic marketplaces that ensure smooth transactions and trust are also central. UNEC has developed a range of interoperable electronic standards and procedures that can not only further reduce the cost of trading, but can also increase safety and resiliency by reducing the need for physical contact, by improving the traceability of products along the value chain, or by making supply chains less dependent on any particular mode of transport. UNIS is helping countries, and especially small and medium enterprises, navigate non-tariff barriers and improve market access. And I really look forward to hearing more about how countries are using these tools and what more we can all do together to foster trade and innovation to build a resilient and sustainable future. With this, ladies and gentlemen, I wish you a very fruitful continuation of your discussions and back to you, dear Elizabeth. Many thanks, Olga, for these inspiring and, and supportive remarks and for placing our work in the context of UNECE's broader work and also the, the different uh, processes happening in the UN, including the, the high-level political forum in New York. Now, you flagged already the importance in, of trade and uh, small and micro, uh, medium-sized enterprises. And we'll now turn to the second uh, part of, of our discussion here, where we will look a little bit more closely at the ways how can we support export-oriented SMEs in bouncing back from the pandemic? And we'll look specifically at like how non-tariff measures can be used as a tool for strengthening the resilience of SMEs and for building productive capacity. And how can all of that be used to stimulate growth and uh, also to, to um, have like growth-inducing indu trade patterns? UNECE has just completed a sub-regional survey of SMEs on these issues and has published two studies already on, on Armenia and on Georgia. And I see we are putting the links already into the chat. Now here, I'm very pleased to introduce two speakers. And let me give the floor first to Ms. Damegul Kabayeva to give us her perspective. And Ms. Kabayeva is a senior diplomat 
at the Kazakhstan mission uh, to international organizations and the UN here in Geneva, and has held previously senior posts also in the Ministry of Trade and Industry. And uh, Ms. Kabayeva also serves as the chair of UNECE's steering committee on trade capacity and standards. Um, Damico, we are very happy to have you. Can I ask you to, to discuss with us how SMEs and particularly export-oriented ones have been affected by the pandemic? What are possible policy responses and what specifically is the role of non-tariff measures in strengthening the international competitiveness and resilience of SMEs? With that, Damego, the floor is yours. Thank you, Elizabeth. Dear Madam Executive Secretary, dear colleagues, good morning. It's, a, it, it's a such a pleasure to be amongst you today and share the policy messages that emerge from SME search efforts that the UNEC is carrying out under my committee, uh, the UNEC Intergovernmental Body on Trade, the Steering Committee on uh, tra uh, Trade Capacity and Standards. This work delivers whole of government approaches to enable governments to uh, increase the contribution of trade to post-COVID-19 recovery with, along, uh, with tangible tools for supporting SMEs recovery and development. The whole, government, uh, the whole of government approaches consist of national action-oriented recommendations um, for gearing non-tariff measures towards serving as tools for uh, recovery and structural uh, transformation. The recommendations are evidence-based. Uh, the recommendation, uh, they draw on the results of uh, national uh, impact assessment surveys using UNEC's evaluation methodology. The UNEC undertook five national assessments in Belarus, Armenia, Georgia, the Republic of Moldova, uh, and Serbia in the course of uh, May, December 2020, uh, uh, which involved the participation of about 2,000 manufacturing and agri SMEs, uh, as well as major freight forwarding companies uh, operating in the five countries. The results highlight the following. First, uh, the MSMEs are unlikely to recover their pre-pandemic export levels once normality is achieved because they have exhausted their coping mechanisms. They are highly indebted because they delayed uh, business payments and used personal savings uh, to maintain operations. Very many companies have also lost their traditional international uh, buyers and supplies due to lockdown measures. They also still face the gross bottlenecks uh, from before the pandemic. Namely, they have weak productive capacities. In this respect, in the implementation of international and regional harmonized standards plays a critical role. The, these studies show that uh, the implementation of these standards helped MSMEs to repurpose production and, as a result, withstand the economic crisis. Second, trade facilitations matter more than, uh, more than ever. In some countries, uh, the slow transition of paperless trading environment created additional costs for MSMEs in the form of delays. Third, at the border, control, including customs clearance, was delayed not only by border closure in, the, in some countries, but also by the lack of basic facilities, such as non-intrusive control means, uh, X-ray machines, place for joint uh, control, parkings, and so on. Fourth, quality infrastructure, including technical regulations, standardization, conformity assessments, and metrology matters. For example, MSMEs had to retest uh, products in export markets because the uh, national, the conformity assessments uh, certificates issued by national 
authorities uh, were not recognized internationally. The above are uh, key, the key messages from the assessment that provide action-oriented recommendations that were agreed upon by the government. Uh, in terms of tools, um, the Secretariat has developed an online training course for helping MSMEs implement international standards, which will be launched in the coming few days. The course was, was developed by one of the steering committee subsidiary body, the working group on standardization and regulatory cooperation. Uh, in addition, the working party on agricultural quality standards, which is the second subsidiary body under, under the steering committee, is developing an online course on agricultural quality and food loss targeting agri MSMEs. This course will be launched in the coming weeks. I look forward for, to discussions under this and the, the remaining segment of the event. Thank you for your attention. Many thanks, Damigul, for this very clear and, and structured presentation and uh, highlighting some of the summaries, which partially, unfortunately, point the gloomy picture. Now, as you said, SMEs are unlikely to recover, but you also pointed to some very clear policy areas, such as international standards, trade facilitation at the border control, quality infrastructure, where we have entry points for creating change. And you, thank you for highlighting the, the very valuable work being undertaken in, in several of the, the intergovernmental bodies um, uh, of UNECE here. Now, having heard uh, these suggestions for policy recommendations, let us briefly turn to our audience with another Mentimeter question, where we are now asking our audience to tell us what, what do you think are the most important tasks for improving the export competitiveness and resilience of MSMEs in, in your country. So you can pick three and you can maybe also be inspired by the presentation uh, and uh, from Ms. Kavayeva before and from UNECE studies. Now, let me turn to our second speaker in this segment. Having heard a policymaker government perspective, let me turn to private sector perspective. And it's my great pleasure to introduce Ms. Tatiana Sterjova Dushkovska, um, who is joining us from the Chamber Investment Forum, the Western Balkan Six. And I understand you're the coordinator of the Chamber's Investment Forum. And uh, you're also the director of the Chamber of Commerce of, of North Macedonia. So I'm very much looking forward to hearing from you, Tatiana, private sector perspective on these issues. The floor is yours. Elizabeth, and I want to thank you all on behalf of the Chamber Investment Forum for inviting us today and providing us the opportunity to speak on the private sector perspective on this very important issue. Let me first start by introducing our association. The Western Balkan Six Chamber Investment Forum uh, it joins the six national chambers of commerce from the Western Balkan region, that is Albania, Kosovo, Bosnia and Herzegovina, North Macedonia, Montenegro and Serbia. Uh, we were founded as an association in 2017 as part of the Berlin process, and we have our headquarters in Trieste. Uh, the general objective of the association is to uh, provide the joint voice of more than 350,000 uh, companies from the region and advocate for a better business environment, for regional cooperation, as well as promoting the region as unique investment destination. Uh, working in the field or in the region of the Western Balkans, of course, one of the uh, objectives of uh, or main goals of the association is uh, contributing towards removing the obstacles for re regional economic cooperation and contributing to improving business and investment climate in the region. And uh, we um, bear our activities by the idea that jointly we can do much more in terms of economic development that any of, of the Western Balkans countries can ever do uh, on their own. Uh, this especially is the case now when we are, are surrounding uh, almost a year from the start of the pandemic. And uh, we are struggling together to make the best for um, providing companies from the region, especially uh, MSMEs, uh, 
overcoming or recovering better from the situation. Similar to most econ uh, European economies, SMEs are also, are also the backbone of uh, Western Balkans economies, and they are the driving force for its growth and progress. Across the world, Western Balkans as a whole, up to 99% uh, of the enterprises are micro, small, and medium sized. And of course, those are the key to ensuring economic growth, innovation, social integration, and most importantly, job creation. In fact, in the six economies of the Western Balkans, SMEs employ between 60 and 80% of the active population, which is on average higher than in the European Union. It goes without saying that precisely it was these companies that were amongst the most hardly affected uh, in course of the pandemic we've been facing the last year. They have more limited resources, they have more limited uh, potes potentials or possibility to get access to finance, and they do not have uh, as much developed managerial capacities. So uh, they had to absorb the greatest hit, especially the exporting uh, one, uh, the companies that have uh, export orientation uh, since the outbreak of the pandemic. Uh, for these reasons, uh, we want to stress the possibility, the need to focus on the fundamentals of the system. And that is, uh, we think that the best way to help the companies recover better from the crisis is to turn back to the fundamentals. And this refers to solving some of the issues that are not new. They were not raised uh, because of the pandemic but they gained much more uh, relevance now that we are facing the situation that we have. And that is the business environment, uh, micro SMEs that want to export from the region face, uh, all the burden they have to bear and all the regulatory and procedural barriers they have to face. I will point uh, some examples just uh, as introduction to the discussion on uh, what uh, micro SMEs, micro and uh, small and medium enterprises had to face even before the pandemics. Uh, there are numerous studies uh, focusing on the region, which state that um, our companies lose uh, more than 26 million hours yearly, standing still on border lines. Uh, that is uh, approximately 80% of the total travel time of uh, the companies uh, exporting from the region, or cumulatively, cumulatively speaking, that is more than 3,000 years annually lost by companies from this region, standing still, preparing and uh, according all the required documents, certificates, analysis, uh, dealing with different inspections and controls, and uh, doing that at each separate border crossing the region of the Western Balkans. This, uh, of course, leads to the situation that uh, in the Western Balkans, only 10 to 20% of the companies in the region decide to engage in exporting activities. And um, this uh, situation severely affects the company's exporting performance, increases their costs, and discourages them from conquering new markets. Uh, let me st state some examples. For example, in Albania, 87% of the companies operate exclusively on the domestic markets. This is situation even before the pandemic and the crisis. And uh, that out of the companies that engage in uh, external uh, trade, only 10% uh, export to the EU and even less, only 3% of all the companies existing in the country, operating in the country, uh, export to some of the other countries in uh, the Western Balkans. The ratio, we are uh, discussing is even more unfavorable in North Macedonia. According to uh, some statistics, only 5% of the total number of companies operating, that is in the years preceding the crisis, engaged in uh, some sort of uh, exporting activities. And the um, uh, ratio is even more, more worse if we bear in mind that uh, the top 10 exporters amounted to more than 50% of the total value of exports uh, on yearly basis from the country. Uh, we, we have had uh, numerous examples of companies that state that uh, they had uh, the need to 
travel two days from uh, some distant point to the borders in the Western Balkans, and then they lose maybe more than three days in uh, traveling the last 200 kilometers throughout the region because they um, lose hours and hours in uh, new controls, issuing new certificate and analysis cert certification and financial procedures. And uh, they have to deal with uncoordinated working hours of the border inspection services. As a result, even before the crisis, companies were discouraged from entering regional or world, world markets. And uh, this situation is even more emphasized now that we have the uh, biggest hit on uh, the pandemic uh, bared by the SMEs. This is not a new situation. Uh, these were all problems that we had even before uh, today's discussion and the situation on uh, inventing how we can uh, help these companies recover better after the crisis. But uh, we must admit that uh, these are all significant obstacles for the, their swift recovery. They would be able to recover and scale up more swiftly if uh, they can uh, more easily engage in experts from the region. And uh, maybe the current crisis that we are facing today is the right time to set uh, some things right that have been dragging on in our systems for many years and uh, to unburden the regulatory and the procedural burden that our companies face on daily level. I kindly thank you once again for the opportunity to addressing uh, the audience today. And I am here to join in the discussion. Thank you. Many thanks, Tatiana, for bringing the private sector perspective to, to our debate and for giving us some very vivid examples of like how, how companies are standing still um, when they are trying to cross the many borders separating Western Balkan countries and what impact that has on their intent also and in their endeavors to exports. You, you gave us some very impressive figures uh, of how little trade and export engagement actually is happening. Now, let me uh, turn to, to our chat and let me pose to our uh, speakers two questions. And I think Tatiana, that is also addressed to you. Um, like one question is a little bit generally about the relationship between trade and, and SDGs, but there is also a very specific question from Mr. Andrei Generalov uh, to Tatiana about what measures could governments take to facilitate trade in the context of COVID-19, and more specifically, again, for the export-oriented SMEs. So let me uh, turn the floor back to our speakers. Maybe, Tatiana, you wish to go ahead, and then we see, Damigol, whether you would wish to add anything or any closing remark. And then we go to the Mentimeter question. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, one of the efforts and the core of the activities uh, faced in the Western Balkans was amongst other the uh, preparation and now starting from January, the implementation of the action plan for the common regional market, which uh, was used as some kind of uh, a, a coordinated tool for uh, easing the position of the companies and coordinating national responses from governments in how to ease uh, the or facilitate the trade for these companies in order to help them recover better. One of the uh, main activities that was undertaken last year as a replica uh, to the EU Green Lines was the introduction of the green corridors amongst the Western Balkans countries. And uh, it was uh, built on in the uh, action plan for the common regional market to include the interconnection of the green corridors we have in the Western Balkans to the uh, control uh, customs uh, control points towards the EU countries, because as I mentioned, uh, EU markets are uh, very valuable uh, trade partners for uh, companies from the region. So um, much can be done, much should be done in easing the position of these companies. Uh, that uh, in the first line uh, includes uh, coordination and uh, bigger levels of trust of our national uh, governments, national institutions, on uh, jointly accepting and recognizing documents and uh, coordinating working hours of uh, inspections and border controls 
and uh, just making the whole process as swiftly as possible as to reduce the time our companies lose at borderlines, uh, standing still and making uh, costs in, instead of uh, bringing prosperity and growth. Thank you, Tatiana. Very clear suggestions about the green corridors, building trust, recognizing each other's documents, coordinating opening hours at the border, all, all very clear and precise. And I, I guess there will be continuation of that discussion also in the chat. Now we've received one further question, which is about the gender implications of all of this. Um, but let me maybe turn to, to the Damigul, whether there's anything general she wishes to add, and then we look at the Mentimeter. Yeah, thank you very much for very, very uh, interesting questions. And uh, I would like to recall the words of the new general, uh, director general of the WTO, uh, that uh, the, the WTO is about people, is, the WTO is about decent work. And uh, we have all, uh, all the um, great uh, objectives uh, that are stated in the Marrakesh Agreement that uh, um, the WTO should raise living standards, ensure full employment, increase incomes, expand the production of and trading goods and services. And uh, um, that's why we can say surely that trade and WTO is about people and, and about the growth about the um, sustainable development. And uh, uh, as um, I would like to um, mention here that Kazakhstan is honored very much to chair and co-host the ministerial, uh, the 12th ministerial conference um, in the end of this year in Geneva. And uh, uh, we see that um, uh, many very interesting nexus um, issues would be uh, would be promoted at this conference, for example, trade and sustainable um, environment, trade and health. So we can say that trade should um, cont contribute to the SDGs, and uh, we all should work on on this very hard. Thank you. Many thanks, Damigul, for, for placing our discussion also in the context of what is happening in, in other fora and the importance of trade being for people, as you so nicely explained. And, and congratulations and, and good luck for the very important role Kazakhstan will be playing in, in the coming month in, in the preparation of the WTO ministerial. Now, um, having discussed policy, let's quickly look at the Mentimeter question, what our audience had to say about uh, what are the most important tasks now for improving export competitiveness and resilience of SMEs? So here we have um, audience responding, identifying two areas with, with great importance, namely conformity assessments and certification for export. And I think that was flagged by, by our speakers as well and uh, regional cooperation to facilitate trade. And I'm, I'm very happy to see those two areas being identified as priorities because both are also at the core of UNECE's work, um, our work on, on trade and economic cooperation, where we do look at conformity assessments and, and regulatory cooperation, and also our role in terms of fostering regional integration. So with this, thank you to our speakers for the second part. And let us now turn to, to part three, where um, we will look a little bit more at trade facilitation. So continuing our discussion from, from session two. And uh, more specifically now in session three, we will look at how electronic business standards and, and tools, and that includes tools developed by UNECE under our UNCFACT forum, how these tools can help build a more resilient trade and a more resilient and sustainable uh, economic recovery. And I'm, I'm very, very happy here to introduce Mr. Alexei Vandarenko, the vice chair of UNCFACT. Alexei, you've done a lot of work with us in UNECE and also with the Eurasian Economic Commission. And I, I think you've really worked on, on these tools such as like 
electronic business standards and, and recommendations, and particularly also the single window, which I understand is a very, very important topic for, for UNECE. Now, question to you, how do these tools facilitate trade? How they, can they facilitate trade during a pandemic? And how can they help us make trade more resilient and support the recovery? Uh, Alexei, the floor is yours, and we'll see whether we manage with the slides. Yes, thank you. Good morning, dear participants of the webinar. It's a great honor for me to speak today and share the results of UNC fact work and experience on today's topic. And uh, I'm sure that many of you already know about UNC fact, but let me say a few words about us for newcomers. Next slide, please. Uh, the UNC fact serves as a focal point for trade facilitation recommendations and electronic business standards. It has a global membership. Altogether, we strive uh, to create a semantic hub of a global business language providing open standards and recommendations. In my presentation, I will focus more uh, on UNC fact recommendation, while Mario Apostolov will talk about more uh, about UNC fact electronic data interchange standards and how it can be put in practice. Next slide. First of all, let me present you our last recommendation, which is fully connected to this uh, theme of this webinar. The recommendation 47 title is a pandemic crisis trade related response. In the future, the year 2020 will be remembered for the COVID pandemic and related consequences. These major disruptions in trade flows should have a relevant and urgent response. How private and public sectors behave need to be reassessed urgently. The radical rethinking of business processes should be managed. Otherwise, similar pandemics and climate change crises will leave the most impactful international trade risks. The idea of new recommendation is to list measures that can be put in place to reduce the impact and allow trade to continue. The recommendation 47 is ready and should be adopted in April. Next slide, please. Uh, COVID-19 is a global challenge. As for international trade, REC 47 contains a list of challenges that we met. Many countries have started to solve these problems on their own. Our main task was to respond country requests and share international best practices and available UNC fact tools that can help overcome the consequences of the pandemic. The UNC fact work in the field of e-business standards has proved to be more in demand than ever before. Next slide, please. Unfortunately, I don't have enough time to reveal the content of all measures proposed in recommendation 47. All listed measures are divided into three groups, building better collaboration, emergency operating procedures, and use of technologies. I encourage all of you to carefully read recommendation 47 and note which measures have not been implemented in practice in your country. I'm sure that this recommendation's value lies precisely in the consistency of selected actions, which will make it possible to achieve significant progress for the country during the period of economic recovery. However, uh, uh, the next slide. However, I will allow myself uh, to pay special attention to the single window as the most comprehensive trade facilitation tool. COVID-19 crisis stressed the trend of digitalization of economy. We have witnessed this trend before, but the lockdown accelerated this trend. Single window project can be regarded as a total digitalization of import, export, and transit formalities. The implementation of national single window for the international trade can consolidate all potential responses. Next slide, please. UNC fact developed uh, a first guidance. Uh, uh, next slide, please. Uh, UNC fact developed the first guidance on single window in 2004. And I like to inform you that we have completely updated the recommendation 33 last year. If you, if you have not read it, uh, please do it. And I also encourage you to read the last deliverables on a single window, uh, such as recommendation 47, single submission portal, and white paper on core principle for managing risk 
in operation systematically important single windows. I also want to, to mention about recommendation 38, which title is uh, trade information portal. This recommendation will be uh, officially published soon. I encourage you to have a look at these documents. Next slide. Uh, more information about our work is available on the web uh, site. And if you are interested to take in part in our work, please feel free to contact me or Secretary Lance Thompson. And I'm here to answer a question if you have some. Thank you. Thank you, Alexei, for this very uh, broad but, but still concise overview. And, and as you mentioned, indeed, UNC Factor, you are one of our vice chairs. It's one of the bodies where we have global membership. So while being the United Nations Regional Commission for, for Europe, we also have fora that are open for all UN member states. And as you also rightly mentioned, UNC Factor Work has been very, very high in demand last year in response to the crisis. And indeed, electronic business standards can, can be very useful here. I see already all the links popping up in the chat. So once again, recommend, uh, the recommendation to look at our recommendation 47, specifically in response to the crisis, uh, 33, the single window, one of our flagship products, and also 38 coming up on, on trade information portals. So congratulations to you and the, the CFAC team for, for the good work here. Now, before we move to our last speaker uh, from UNECE Secretariat, let us once again turn to our audience. We still, we've reduced a little bit the, the participants, but we still have 60 people with us. And let us ask our audience now, looking at uh, trade policies, yeah? What, what is the main topic that trade policies need to focus on for a more resilient post-COVID-19 recovery? And here, the categories you can choose amongst with are a little bit broader, but they will help us for our concluding remarks. So very much looking forward to hearing from the audience what your views are on this. And with that, let me turn now uh, to our last speaker. I'm very happy to, to welcome a colleague from the UNECE Secretariat. Very happy to welcome Mario Apostolov who is the regional advisor of the Economic Cooperation and, and Trade Division. And uh, Mario, as, as our regional advisor on, on trade, you're really working closely with our member states on, on many of the issues we have been discussing today. And, and you see the very concrete challenges they are facing. So maybe tell us uh, here now in this uh, webinar about what are the implementation challenges you have come across in your work how we can address them and what do governments and other stakeholders need to do um, when facing these different obstacles and, and what's the role of electronic business standards. Now, Mario, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, well, there, I have a small presentation, uh, please uh, put it on. Yes, um, trade facilitation can help a lot uh, in many ways uh, to uh, solve the issues that are uh, raising from the uh, COVID uh, pandemic. Most problems that uh, the pandemic uh, has uh, uh, shown are pre-existing issues that have been amplified uh, during the uh, the disruption of uh, uh, cross-border um, movements of goods and uh, trade. Uh, so. Uh, trade facilitation is basically about the elimination of uh, uh, waste in um, social practices, in uh, international trade, in uh, uh, waste in resources. So it has much to uh, to uh, to help uh, in the recovery after the uh, pandemic. Uh, so what are the implementation challenges? First of all, can you put the next slide, please? Uh, we at the UN we have always thought of our work in terms of uh, uh, producing international public goods. These standards that uh, uh, Alexei was talking about are international public goods that uh, uh, international business and uh, governments can use. So they have existed. Like, uh, let me make a link to the innovation section uh, session that we had before. Innovation is not simply uh, inventing things. It is about things that have existed but probably make them uh, use them better and uh, paradoxically the uh, pandemic has op opened a window of opportunity that we see that in international trade and transport there is too much um, 
separation, like uh, uh, the um, the uh, international transport chains and uh, supply chains have been split into silos. Somebody mentioned already uh, the uh, the problem of working in silos. So the tools exist. Uh, Andre was talking. Uh, sorry, Alexei was talking about them. And uh, now with the, the uh, pandemic, uh, the UN has put together a big project. All the regional commissions, uh, the five regional commissions, and NANCTAD to uh, raise these tools that exist and uh, find solutions. From our side, we have looked into the uh, standards for uh, multimodal uh, transport um, digitalization so that we can uh, offer an opportunity uh, like the, the international uh, standards as public goods to be used by business and uh, countries to have a seamless flow of information along the transport and uh, supply chains. And as you know, the goods can't move faster than the information about them. And the like, uh, so we were looking at the existing standards plus creating new to fill in the gaps uh, for the key documents are covering cargo in uh, different modes of transport like uh, railway, um, uh, in inland water transport, road, sea, and now we are starting to work on air. In all this, the idea is to base all this on the UNC FACT uh, standards. Uh, UNC FACT is the UN Center for uh, Trade Facilitation and Electronic Business, which, uh, um, which Alexei already presented. And one particular standard is in the center, the multimodal transport reference data model, which has already all the data that can be used in the different uh, modes of transport. And then we are looking into pilot uh, uh, applications, uh, implementations. This is exactly the question that uh, uh, Elizabeth, you were asking. And we are working already on implementation. For example, one of the uh, very interesting implementations is the uh, multimodal FIATA bill of lading, uh, which during our project last autumn, uh, experts from FIATA, you know, FIATA is the International Freight Forwarders Association, and uh, experts from CFAC have worked on to develop a new electronic uh, uh, electronic tool, um, uh, that uh, electronic uh, form of the document that is aligned to the multimodal transport reference data model, providing a uh, common denominator, common language to exchange data with other modes of transport. Next slide, please. Here you can see uh, first, uh, in the first group, these are the standards for documents that have already existed before the pandemic. Then uh, in the second uh, uh, tier, you can see uh, documents, standards for which uh, we have prepared in the first phase of our project uh, during the last summer in the beginning of the autumn. And then uh, lately we have developed the key documents like in end of February, we finished with the package of uh, standards for the key documents in the main uh, transport uh, uh, modes of transport. And on my slide, I can't see that, but there is a fourth group. We are, we are starting to work with uh, the airline, uh, with the air cargo industry, notably with our colleague organization, ICAO, which is a UN organization uh, in the airline industry, uh, with uh, which we are working now, uh, we're starting work now on the air uh, cargo industry. So the point is to, uh, thank you for this, the point is to bring all the data uh, together using a common uh, uh, foundation, this uh, multimodal transport reference data model of UNC FACT, to have the common language and uh, have a smooth uh, flow of information. Next slide, please. And we are not destroying any um, any existing standards, like uh, whatever has been done by IATA, well, this uh, private sector association in the airline industry, uh, in the railway industry, the standards that exist are taken and we are creating the interoperability. Interoperability is the buzzword here. And the UN is exactly well placed to, to, to put that in, in this uh, like opened window of opportunity during the, the, the current uh, pandemic. So on this slide, I'm showing how this can, uh, like very schematically, how this can work. Imagine a, a container that is moved by a ship, then uh, transferred on a uh, on a train, then on a on a truck, and also it can be put uh, on uh, on an airplane. And all this 
can uh, like the information can flow there will be no stop uh, uh, for the information to stop and change it uh, we are not touching the legal regimes the legal regimes the con uh, conventions etc uh, they stay and if this is harmonized this line uh, well uh, some people will compare it to a snake but it's not a snake uh, it's uh, it's a line showing that if the information is harmonized in the business domain it can go down to the uh, regulatory agencies to customs uh, or maybe not down but up uh, to uh, to customs so that those agencies the regulatory agencies can perform their uh, their functions uh, in a better way so we achieve both contactless uh, trade uh, like less uh, risks of contamination, etc. Well, my colleague from ICAO is uh, citing a figure that the virus can survive four days for four days on paper. Uh, so uh, eliminating paper has a, a health implication. Well, this is just anecdotal uh, uh, kind of uh, evidence. I, I don't know whether that's exactly true, but uh, that's what uh, experts are saying. And uh, then uh, we have uh, the uh, increase in efficiency. So both uh, kind of looking at the safety and the efficiency. So let's quickly uh, finish this presentation, please. Next slide. Well, this may seem a boring uh, uh, table, but experts are quite excited because this is one of the products of uh, what we have done last autumn. Uh, experts have mapped different documents. You can see in the columns, there are different documents uh, like uh, uh, the ECMR uh, road consignment note, the Mar maritime bill of lading, etc. the railway uh, documents, and we will be adding air here. So here you can see what is the data that is repeated in the different documents so that that data can flow uh, uh, without uh, interruption in such a, a multi-model uh, flow of information. Thank you. Next slide. Um, next slide. Yes, this is just an illustration of one of the pilot projects that, well, uh, uh, for the time being the first one, uh, for like exports of one product, uh, um, wood and cellulose from Belarus uh, via uh, train, truck, uh, then uh, river, the, the Dnieper River, uh, to the Black Sea, then the Black Sea, uh, and then uh, the Danube River to Central Europe. Uh, so this is a practical case. The, the report is already published on our website. Uh, no, uh, the, the website of the uh, project that uh, we are talking about. And uh, then uh, um, you can see how data can flow uh, through, uh, via this uh, multimodal route. Next slide. So uh, I would like to thank you. One of the things we lost, and uh, I don't know whether you saw that, there was a uh, reference to the Yes, exactly. Now it's in the in the chat. Uh, the very last uh, reference. Thank you, Nitya, for uh, putting it there. But it was on one of my slides, and in, on my computer I couldn't see it. Uh, the very last one uh, is the um, UN uh, Trade and Transport Connectivity Project, where the uh, standards are published. This is just a segment. You see there exactly the the, the URL of the segment. You can see all the standards there that are produced in this project and uh, the reports of this pilot project. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mario, for um, giving us that, that overview and bringing us to that buzzword, as you said, interoperability. So that's really the idea uh, behind uh, making sure that uh, data can move seamlessly between different types of, of transport, ship, train, trucks, airplanes. And I'm very proud uh, that uh, you are undertaking this work as part of our United Nations Development Account COVID response, where we are developing hands-on and practical solutions for uh, improving that multimodal transport uh, um, connectivity along the corridors you mentioned. So thank you for shedding some light on this. I've seen um, in the chat there is an exchange between Mr. Andrei Gerarov and, and Alexei about the application of um, certain UNC fact measures from recommendation 47 in, in the Russian Federation. So very interesting to, to read what is happening here. Um, maybe um, let me look at our two speakers, whether there are any concluding remarks they wish to make, whether Alexei you wish to add something or respond. And afterwards or alternatively, we move to the Mentimeter. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you for the questions. Uh, I I'd like to invite all of you to participate in our UNC Fact activity and believe there are a lot of 
domains which will be interested to all of you. We have a work on SMEs, on platforms, on blockchains, on uh, single windows. There are a lot of uh, application of your talents and uh, I'd like to invite you to participate in, in our activities. Thank you for that invitation. Indeed, UNC FACT has an extremely broad range of issues that you are covering. And um, yeah, we will have our UNC FACT plenary scheduled for, for mid-April. Um, in uh, So that, that's quite soon. Um, now, with that, let us look at uh, uh, the concluding question we had posed to our audience and uh, see what we can uh, learn from, from our Mentimeter exercise. Uh, what are really some of the, the core policy areas again for, for engagement. Um, and let us see whether we can pull up the results here. So that's a much broader question that we posed at the end. What are the main trade policy topics that need to, to uh, that policymakers need to focus on? And, and here we've had issues such as better public-private cooperation, better exchange of information, enhancing transparency, and traceability and better interagency cooperation. So we can see that all four of them are, are considered important and uh, clearly cooperation between public and private sector uh, is crucial. Exchanging information, that was just the topic of, of the last session and transparency and, and traceability in document exchanges is clearly uh, relevant here too. So uh, thank you to the audience for engaging. And now uh, we are, eight minutes of our time and I, I will be pleased to, to conclude our uh, webinar, our session here. Um, it shows there is so much scope for discussion on, on these important topics and um, what we've tried to do in our session on how innovation and trade can help us build back better uh, after, after COVID-19 is we've tried to structure it a little bit around the areas of work here in UNECE's Economic Cooperation and Trade Division. And we've started by looking at innovation, the role of innovation in building back better and particularly the role of platform economies where we've had great examples from Sweden uh, about what is happening there. And uh, where we also pointed to the importance of innovation policy and that more can be done here. And I would like to invite all of our audience to join us next week at the event we are having for innovative high growth enterprises, where we will zoom further into the type of innovation policies for high growth enterprises. Now, after that, we have uh, uh, welcomed our executive secretary and I'm very grateful again to Ms. Algarierov, Algarierova for having joined us. And then we transitioned to the specific issue of SMEs and, and non-tariff measures. And here I'm very pleased that we could hear from both private sector and, and uh, government perspective about the, the specific challenges and, and the very concrete uh, challenges that SMEs are facing. It's a little bit a gloomy picture, but that also points us to how important it is to support SMEs and uh, to find the right policies and also to harness the power of trade here. And here again, I'm very pleased to draw our audience attention to uh, the training module we will be launching next week. That's a training module on building stronger economies after COVID, standards implementation for boosting MSME's resilience. So please do stay tuned for our training module next week. Last but not least, we zoomed into the specific topic of trade facilitation and electronic business standards um, carried out under UNC FACT, where we've heard uh, about our different recommendations and uh, then concluded with the discussion of uh, the importance of interoperability and uh, UNC FACT's multimodal transport reference that data model and uh, heard about the very concrete application in the context of our United Nations Development Account COVID response project. So again, for UNC FACT, please do stay tuned. We have our UNC FACT plenary mid-April, uh, so in, in a few weeks time, and where we will have enough time to really go into the depth of the different issues covered by, by UNC FACT. And thank you to Alexei for, as one of the UNC FACT vice chairs, as being with us here today. Now, let me close with a word of thanks to all our amazing speakers for, for sharing their insights. Um, it was really a very rich and very diverse debate. 
Thank you also to our audience for engaging so proactively with us through the chat. We've had great questions in the chat and through the Mentimeter question. And uh, of course, a big thank you also to all of those in the team who have worked so hard to, to make this session happen. That's our partners at the Geneva Trade Platform, particularly Dimitri, Ioannita, Michael, and, and Nitya. And uh, also a great word of thank you to the UNECE team here in the Economic Cooperation and Trade Division. That's Ralph, Hannah, Charles, and, and Mariam, in addition to our speakers, Anders and, and uh, Mario. So many thanks to everybody. Today's uh, event was really interesting. And I think is the success is also a document of our joint achievement. And with this, I wish you all a wonderful day and enjoy the rest of UNECE's Regional Forum on Sustainable Development. Thank you for having joined us.